I'll give you the, a little bit of the story that we've learned. I will tell you, I owe uh, most of this work to three surgeons, Dave Sutherland, Jan Friedan, and Hank Chambers, who are all operating on children who have cerebral palsy. And then a recent uh, postdoc, now junior colleague, Sudarshan Dianidi, who is a physical therapist who has turned into a very good muscle biologist. So I'll just cut to the chase. I believe this relationship. I know the circumlink tension relationship is taking some hits in the literature, but I, in my opinion, as an old guy, I think most of the criticism of the circumlink tension relationship is based on r fairly poor data in non-physiological systems, specifically myofibrillar contracting systems. But if you take this at face value, the key issue, and this is what I did my PhD thesis on, the circumlink tension relationship in frogs. I actually presented it to Andrew Huxley. And he said to me, well, we know that sarcomeres operate on the plateau. So um, the, the descending limbs are a bit artifactual, aren't they? And I remember being shocked because I had no answer for him. I had never even thought of the question. And of course, Andrew Huxley is a genius. He's brilliant. He knows everything. I went, I was in London. I left and I went home in humiliation and asked myself the question, what is the physiological operating range? And I did a bunch of experiments in frogs that I won't describe, but someday we can talk about. But I really got interested because I was, I was working with a hand surgeon on developing this laser diffraction technique, which we had used in the lab, but, but using it in the operating room. And there are many things we can talk about in terms of methodology, but, but to put it briefly, we isolate a muscle. And as Carlo mentioned, most of our work has been in the wrist uh, flexors and extensors. You can isolate a muscle bundle, and obviously you're getting a resting sarcomer length, and there are a lot of assumptions. You have to make sure you don't stretch muscle fibers. Um, but we've measured, I, I've actually been sh a little bit shocked that sarcomer length is very repeatable in humans, in various muscles. And what we found was not only was it repeatable, but if you measure these diffraction orders, the wrist flexors and the wrist extensors, this is the point we were just talking about, uh, tend to be systematically at different lengths. And again, to boil it down to a cartoon, the extensors tend to operate on the plateau and descending limb of the length tension curve, the flexors on the plateau and the ascending limb of the length tension curve. And of course here, I'm even drawing a dot at 1.5. So I criticize myself here. Um, these are calculations based on uh, uh, trying to understand muscle tendon dynamics. But I'll say from a design point of view, we believe that flexors and extensors operate at systematically different sarcomer lengths. And as you go from flexion to extension, flexors get longer and stronger and extensors get shorter and stronger. And that the idea is, at least for the wrist, that the wrist is a very stable base for finger manipulation. And it's a beautiful evolutionary design, which uh, allows muscles to systematically live at different sarcomer lengths. So vis-a-vis -vis the, the previous comment that sarcomere lengths cannot be different. I believe that sarcomere lengths can be different between muscles within a species and they can be systematically different. And that systematic difference then relates to the function of the muscle. I won't show you the data, but I've also got data on hamstring muscles and I've got data on the deep muscles of the spine that show that spine muscles, for example, are almost exclusively on the ascending limb of the length tension curve. Uh, even during in, in relatively normal muscle. Okay, that's a side. That's a little bit of a side bet. But uh, we've been very interested in this issue in children with cerebral palsy, and I just wanted to show another uh, image of a child who's about to undergo the lengthening of their soleus. And these are sample sizes that are very high, where we're generating data from 20 kids with CP, 20 typically developing kids, where we'd measure fascicle length. And then in the operating room, measure sarcomer length by laser diffraction. And this is a really important graph in my opinion. This is fascicle length in kids with CP compared to kids with typical development. If you look at the meta-analysis from uh, Australia, uh, Glenn's work and Lee Barber's work, uh, in CP at least, the, 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 uh, um, the general conclusion from the literature, from a good meta-analysis that they did, is that CP fascicles are shorter in general by a little bit than TD fascicles. In our hands, they were not significantly different. And the reason I want to, to dwell on this point is that ultrasound, of course, is an important imaging method that we use in humans because we don't have very many tools, but it does not give us sarcomere length data. 
And the key from this study was that while fascicle length is similar, the sarcomere length was dramatically different in kids with CP. This is this was a shocking finding. I remember, you know, you guys are muscle people like me. When you put a laser in a muscle that's at long sarcomere length, the diffraction lines are sharp and they're very close together. So a, a, a sarcomere length in a child of four, four microns compared to the typically developing kids that were about two, not only are these numbers quite different, dramatically different, but they are uh, structurally, it's possible to show differences because of the sharpness of the diffraction line. And the laser diffraction pattern does give you sarcomere length, but it also gives you sarcomere length variability. And these sarcomeres are extremely uniform. And I can show you some pictures. And what this says is this model in kids with cerebral palsy, the contracture is not like any animal model because these sarcomeres, the wrist is flexed, the muscle is shortened. If you cut the tendon, the muscle retracts, but these muscles are living at a sarcomere length of four microns for years. And if you remember uh, uh, the previous data we've seen in this session, sarcomeres don't like long sarcomere lengths, right? If you stretch a normal muscle, it will add sarcomeres to bring back to optimal. And if you shorten a normal muscle, it will subtract sarcomeres to come back to optimal. Now that, let me just say, that's true for a mouse, cat, and rabbit soleus muscle. The soleus muscle of these small animals is not like a human muscle. And in fact, in humans, there is evidence, uh, we saw the case report, there is some direct evidence that in the quadriceps muscle, you can stretch the muscle and add sarcomeres. But we've done the same studies in upper extremity muscles and the opposite is never true. You cannot shorten a human muscle and have it take up sarcomeres. And this is one of the reasons when, when I train, when Jan and I train surgeons to do these tendon transfers, every surgeon knows you can never put in a muscle at slack length, it's, it's suicide. That muscle will never work again. If a human muscle were simply a big version of a mouse muscle or a cat or a rabbit muscle, the, the length you put it in during surgery wouldn't really matter. It would just readjust. And I don't believe this is true and I think one of the things, one of the one of my conclusions has been that human muscle and animal muscle may have different adaptation rules. And certainly if it's true in serial sarcomere number addition, it's true in parallel sarcomere number addition, atrophy and hypertrophy. And so we all have to admit a little bit of ignorance there. We're still making the rules. But at least with regard to cerebral palsy, what this told me is this muscle is having some trouble and it's having trouble adding serial sarcomeres. Why? First of all, I'll say I don't know. But I started thinking about the serial sarcomere number problem as a growth problem. And this is work that Sudarshan did where we, this is a meta-analysis of all the fiber areas we could find from single fiber experiments, from histology experiments as a function of age, um, all the single fi fiber experiments that where someone had reported an area and the red data are kids with CP across an age range from like five to 20. And the blue squares are typically developing data. You know, we can get those at birth. But the point is that if you look at the growth rate, uh, the fiber area development rate, you can see that typically developing is much greater than CP. And as we all know, the satellite cell is implicated in growth in muscle. Satellite cells become activated, they proliferate, they form myotubes. And we started asking the question, what are satellite cells doing in cerebral palsy? So I'm a mechanics guy. Now I'm starting to have to get a little bit into the biology. And as you remember, the satellite cell is a, an undifferentiated stem cell that stays on the surface of the muscle cell. It's its own cell. It's outside the, basal, outside the cell membrane underneath the basal lamina. And then as we spoke before, Satellite cells typically are quiescent, so they're PAC7 positive, but they're negative for the various transcription factors. As they get activated, they uh, get activated, they mature, they differentiate, and they form these myotubes that then fuse with the muscle cell. So we asked a very simple question um, because it had already been asked in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy world, how are satellite cells doing in cerebral palsy? And it turned out that if you measure, so you just isolate muscle. This is from Hank Chambers' patients. Um, this was Lucas Smith's P, part of his PhD thesis. Satellite cell content was down by about 70% in um, muscles from children with cerebral palsy. 
And if you think of that, if you take it at face value, and I will just tell you control experiments showed that it's true. It's not just an artifact of this. This was a flow sorting method, which can have artifacts, but we confirmed it with other methods. If this is true in cerebral palsy, it's really bad news because it has tremendous implications for growth, repair, regeneration, hypertrophy, even therapy. Just think if you're a physical therapist or an exercise physiologist and you're trying to make these muscles stronger. If these muscles are working with a, let's say, only 20% of the normal number of satellite cells, it's terrible news because those muscles are gonna have difficulty growing. So what's going on? Well, this is where we started. Uh, there's some interesting stories that I'll, I'll tell you about, but this is where we started trying to understand the biology of satellite cells and skeletal muscle. In fact, somebody said to me, why don't we just grow satellite cells in a culture and inject them into the kids with cerebral palsy? You, you guys probably know about the clinical trial up at Stanford that was done for Duchenne. The idea was if, they're lose, if they've lost satellite cells, just grow the cells and put them back in so you can have a greater number. So we started growing them. And it turns out it's not as easy as I thought it would be. In fact, I guaranteed a group of people that I could grow satellite cells because I had done it before in mouse and humans. So on the left-hand panel, you can see these beautiful, big, thick myotubes from children. These are children undergoing knee ligament reconstruction and these are hamstring muscles, but the, the red immunostain in the culture is slow myosin heavy chain. So these muscles are making sarcomeres. Yes, they're immature sarcomeres. They beat spontaneously and they have lots of cells. So these are multinucleated myotubes and the wheat germ agglutinin stains the extracellular matrix and it's modest. Whereas in kids with CP, you can still, they still have satellite cells and you can still grow them, but the cells themselves are, let's say um, there's less myonuclei. They have a lower fusion index, we would call it. They're smaller and there's a tremendous increase in the extracellular components of the muscle. So uh, this is where I started working with a uh, really great cell biologist, actually a, an Italian Swiss cell biologist trained in Australia, postdoc in San Diego. So we got the international group. This is Andy Dominighetti. Uh, he started studying these cells in culture. And one of the things we know about cells that proliferate like crazy, because these do proliferate well, they just don't fuse, is they often are hypermethylated in their promoter region. So I'm just showing you one gene. This is the integrin beta one gene, which is the muscle integrin. The promoters in CP are hypermethylated. Andy showed this a bunch of different ways. And I can, I can show you the data and I'll show you the reference in a second. And most importantly, hypermethylation was associated with their inability to differentiate and fuse. And these are the kinds of pictures I was just showing you. So he said, okay, this is hypermethylation, which is not uncommon in uh, other disease models. But what do you think of when you think of hypermethylation and inability to differentiate? It's a disease. It's a, it's a disease kind of like a cancer, right? Hypermethyl, uh, hypermethylation, which is true in cancer, uh, extreme proliferation, cancer, inability to differentiate, cancer. So Andy tried a very simple experiment. Let's take the most common cancer drug out there used in children to demethylate promoters. And uh, this is mostly for uh, uh, leukemia or bloodborne cancers. So Andy simply did the experiment where he uh, incubated these cells for 24 hours in 5-azocytidine or that um, Vidaza was the, is the trade name. And you can see this was a complete rescue experiment where by demethylating the promoter region of many genes, this, we, we, we have a paper in press that is a genome-wide uh, uh, methylome um, analysis. He not only uh, demethylated the promoter, but he restored these muscles ability, these satellite cells ability to fuse and differentiate. And so we're in the middle now, uh, because this is, you know, um, you probably know this work is very difficult. We're in the middle of an FDA. Um, we just received approval from the FDA to use 5-azocytidine for another indication. It's normally indicated by cancer, for cancer. We're working with cancer doctors and orthopedic surgeons to do a dose escalation study where we're dosing children with azocytidine seven days before their surgery. Then we're taking muscle biopsies and we're trying to understand the correct dosing in order to bring these muscle cells back to normal. Because the idea is, yes, surgery can help children with cerebral palsy, but wouldn't it be cool 
This is a cheap drug. It's going to go generic very soon. Uh, wouldn't it be cool to be able to treat contractures um, non-surgically? Not only that, kids with CP do respond to exercise, but not that well. The muscles, they do hypertrophy somewhat, but it's not great. And I think part of that is this hypermethylation means these cells are just inactivated biologically. You can exercise them all you want, and we do, but in order to really get the biggest bang for the buck, we hope to be able to do that now in, um, in treated muscles and get a bigger result. I also want to, left. Yep, yep. And my last slide, just refer to this new method that I'm talking about. We need better tools in humans. And it's become, it's very obvious in these studies. Um, you talked about Scott's um, uh, microendoscopy method. I don't like the method because you really can't use it in activated muscle. That Sanchez paper is not a paper on sarcomere shortening. That Sanchez paper is a paper on sarcomere translocation across the face of the endoscope. You look at the paper carefully, there is not sarcomere shortening, there's sarcomere movement, which is easy to measure and it's a twitch. You need to be able, as, as we've talked about, especially like Elena's previous talk, we need to be able to measure sarcomere shortening in an intact whole muscle where the mechanical properties of the muscles are restored. So this is a method developed with a colleague in San Diego, Stoyan Radic, who's a photonics expert, where essentially we put a fiber optic probe into the muscle and using multiple wavelengths, not just laser diffraction, it's actually a different phenomenon. It's, it's resonance, right? If you stick every wavelength into a muscle, there will be some wavelength that will reflect based on whatever the sarcomere length is, wherever the sarcomere lengths are, right? Now in real time, we can measure sarcomere length. Look at, the, look at the scale, that's a five nanometer resolution scale. Now, yes, this is only a twitch and it's only, it's, it's a whole muscle, this is a rabbit muscle. Right now, honestly, to tell you the truth, our biggest problem is the fiber optics. We break them. And I don't mind breaking them off in a rabbit, but it's a big problem if you break them off in a human. It's a little piece of glass. So we're working now on the mechanical setup of the fibers in order to be able to measure these. The point about this is, I want to show you this too. Resonant reflection spectroscopy allows you to select your length. So it's possible within about a, I would say, a two millimeter by two millimeter by two millimeter cube it's possible to get a three-dimensional reconstruction. You have microsecond time resolution. That's not a problem. A millisecond, a microsecond time resolution within a millimeter cube with nanometer uh, spatial resolution of sarcomere lengths. And that's sort of where we're going with this kind of stuff. So to summarize, um, muscle contractures represent a complex, I think it's a human muscle adaptation. I don't, we, we just don't see it in animal models, even animal models with upper motor neuron lesions. The passive muscle properties are altered to a greater extent than passive than active. Actually, I've never shown active single fiber data, but the single fiber data from kids with CP is very normal. Uh, the CP muscle does represent, it has trouble growing. I showed you that. And I think the reason we're having trouble with therapy is all these areas we don't understand we're talking about today. And we can talk about those maybe more in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for these fantastic talk and these very innovative techniques. Um, and I'm sure that uh, there will be lots of qu questions on this sure. talk because it's very exciting. Uh, any questions? Please go ahead. Hugo, uh, sorry, Feliciano, would you start? No. Since you are, you are one of the few clinical person here, what about the model of bone length and, of course, muscle length? That was famous or they started maybe 20 years ago, but I think that there were big, big problem in length in the muscle, which is the opposite than your model of contracture. But I think we, we have to uh, offer to basic scientists these two opposite model in animals, of course. Try sure. again to, to, to recognize the limitation of uh, muscle. It seems that the muscle need activity even to maintain fundamental structure much more deep than how heavy are the muscles. 
You agree on this? I, I agree. Uh, so distraction osteogenesis, you're right. In a way, it's we will a great... do a, We will do a session on uh, lengthening, lengthening the muscle next year. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> just distraction osteogenesis is a great model mechanically, but it's, it's very complicated. And I think uh, it, clinically, the basic story is that distraction osteogenesis is useful, especially in pediatrics, but it, the speed at which you elongate the bone is critical. You have to go fast enough so that the bone doesn't heal. And that's a problem. If you go even a little bit too fast, you tear connective tissue, you cause intramuscular bleeding and you cause, cause nerve palsies. So it's a, it's a very sophisticated thing. And of course, across a femur or a tibia, you have some muscles with long fibers, some muscles with short fibers. So the sarcomere lengthening velocity varies among muscles and you have to be uh, adjusting your distraction velocity according to the most uh, conservative muscle. This is why I think we need, somebody needs to do it in animal models. I will tell you, I've tried many times to get those grants funded in the United States. I would say most or many of the American muscle physiologists are not interested in sarcomere number adaptation, even though this, this meeting is. But I think actually, that, that that could be a good, a good idea to collect money no, 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 I don't want to collect money, but I will, I'm, I'm, that's part of the reason I'm in Chicago. I will fund that work. I just can't do it by NIH grants. I'll get it done. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. Any more questions? I want to try to reconcile divergences by just thinking that we are talking a different language. So when you say different sarcomere length, are you talking about a sar sarcomere obviously changing length when we extend them and when we contract them? So if you tell me different sarcomere length uh, being different overlapping of filaments, or you are telling me that sarcomere have a different length because the myofilaments have a different length? The former. The sarcomeres oh, have okay, a different length. Then, then, okay, yeah. yeah. The sarcom yeah. Well, so, yeah, obviously sarcomere can be different length because we can stretch them, yeah. But here's the key, here's the key. And this is why it's news. In the, especially in the contracture model, if you stretch any other mammalian sarcomere to four microns, that will last for a couple of days at the most because that muscle will undergo tremendous synthesis to bring those sarcomeres back to yes. a rest, right? These kids with CP, the muscle is highly stretched. It's under tremendous tension and they're fixed at four microns. But that's yeah. Oh, it froze. Perfect timing. <laughs> Look at that. That's a great thing. But what? Um, let me just add while he's thinking. Um, the sarcomeres are stretched, and when we take the fibers out of the child, we've measured with Belia Fowler really good filament length measurements in myosin and actin. The filament lengths are exactly the normal, and the the uh, force production, the length tension properties of the single cells are very normal. So for some reason, these muscles are living at long sarcomere lengths, whereas normal sarcomeres will not do that. Okay. Any more questions? I had another point. Please, I mean, uh, the reference to the uh, sarcomere, ten sarcomere length tension curve as proposed originally from my, by Andrew Axley for the frog and then modified because of the different uh, filament length by Walker, Schroeder and Walker for humans. Represents something that is only true for maximal contraction, but this in reality never happens in physiological condition. So what would be more interesting to see is the type of sarcomere length, uh, sarcomere length tension curve for submaximal contraction which was studied by Robert Close in the 70s in uh, mam small mammals like mouse or uh, rat or so. But I th think that there is no indication about how it is in humans. Anyway, the top, the optimal condition is a very high sarcomere length, very likely because there is some kind of uh, regulation of the excitation contraction coupling depending on the sarcomere length, a bit like it happens in the cardiac mass. You know? mm. So it will be very interesting also to see, I mean, I don't know which, uh, which type of experiment is possible to do, what well, type of relation yeah. for some maximal contraction to hold in the human mass. You know? 
I agree with you that submaximal with distributed motor unit activation is physiological. One of the reasons I did that frog experiment with uh, uh, Yasuo Kawakami, you know, 20 years ago now, is I, I watched all of the people doing biomechanical modeling and everyone assumes here's a muscle, here's the pination angle. Everyone assumed they knew the biomechanics of how this muscle is working against its own tendon. And as I mentioned earlier, we have explicit data showing that we, we know the exact properties of the muscle, we know the exact properties of the tendon, and we still can't predict sarcomere shortening, the magnitude of sarcomere shortening in an isolated frog muscle. That's why I sort of changed the way I was gonna study it. And it's exactly what you're saying, Carlo. I'm focusing now on new ways of measuring the actual sarcomere length in living human muscle under physiological conditions. That requires new tools. And I think uh, we'll see maybe over the next decade, the use of these tools will blow these biomechanical models out of the water. I can't find a single model that gives me a realistic prediction, including my own, by the way, that gives me a realistic prediction of when I actually measure what's going on in the person, which is frustrating. Thank you. Well, th th thank you very much, Richard. Indeed, this is a very, <laughs> very, very good point. Uh, I had a, 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 one question um, regarding the variability in uh, sarcomere length uh, along the, 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 the muscle fiber. Um, yes. Can you? Uh, sure. I mean, but so far, um, we have assumed that sarcomere length is constant along the muscle fibers. So, right, so it's not, as you know, and uh, Carlo and, and many other of you have shown that the sarcomere length uh, decreases near the muscle tendon junction. When you measure sarcomere length in a whole muscle, I would say it's very, you know, it's probably variable roughly 10%. It's non-random. It, uh, it shortens any time a, a muscle fiber gets specialized to go into the muscle tendon junction, the sarcomeres get shorter and stiffer. But what I, um, I've only done one experiment. I did it with Sam Ward where we took a giant rabbit muscle and we measured its length tension properties and we tried to model it as a big sarcomere. And of course, with, um, within, with a big sarcomere, the, you should be able to predict, if you know sarcomere length and you know the number of sarcomeres, you should be able to pick the gross muscle length tension curve. So in three large rabbit muscles, we were able to very easily predict the active length tension curves, no problem. So my, my first conclusion is to a first approximation, a muscle is a big sarcomere. And the sarcomere length variability is fairly random and the shorter sarcomeres at the end don't end up functionally altering whole muscle properties. But what, did, what, what we could not explain was the passive mechanical properties. We were off by an order of magnitude. And what's more, anytime we altered the muscle's properties by let's say chronic immobilization, denervation or whatever, then the architectural properties of the muscle were not good predictors of whole muscle function. So for an intact, normal, large mammalian muscle, I think that's a fairly good assumption. It's a big sarcomere. In the plasticity models, and certainly in any disease, I think it's a terrible assumption. Thank you very much, Richard, for clarifying this point. And of course, we have a lot to learn, but these innovative techniques afford us a lot of time to invest in the future. Correct.